First, let me say what an honor it is that I was asked to speak at this memorial panel for Donna. I focus here on getting to know her as co-editor of the Proceedings of the Western Society for French History, and I begin with two anecdotes. Many years ago, when I was completing my master's at the State University of New York at Albany and preparing to go elsewhere for a doctorate, I naturally thought to ask one of my professors for recommendation. When I went into his office to make my request, the bomb place looked like a work bomb had exploded. Stacks of books and papers were piled everywhere, vividly communicating the press of other business. I immediately apologized for burdening him with yet another task. April, he said simply, someone did it for me. Several years later, I was having a conversation with a colleague. No one here, I should note, and most likely no one anyone here knows. He had been asked to edit a volume by scholars in his field. He was trying to decide whether to do it. I made encouraging noises. He had tenure. He no longer had to worry every waking moment about that all-consuming effort. This kind of work was important to his field, and it was a service to the profession. Yes, he responded a bit impatiently, but what's in it for me? I intend these anecdotes to frame my discussion of a quality that Donna possessed in abundance, a quality I had a privilege and pleasure of seeing in action in our work together, and that quality is generosity. The first anecdote was one of my very first encounters with it. I relate the second because I never heard Donna say, indeed, I have a very hard time imagining her saying, what's in it for me? The proceedings brought Donna and me together. We were very aware of the extraordinary work Kay Edwards and Carol Harrison did finishing up the last paper volumes and effecting the transition to an online publication. We were deeply appreciative of and keen to continue their high standard of quality. Donna was a very generous woman, but she was neither a martyr nor a fool. She was not going to waste her time on inferior work. But we also both valued the role that the Western and the proceedings had played for us as graduate students when we were learning to become scholars. Sometimes that meant selecting articles that had compelling structure, uh, compelling subjects, but that required, shall we say, more strenuous editorial intervention. For reasons I have yet to fathom, where, um, those, most of those fell to Donna. I'm not going to say that she sometimes did not complain. We are professors, after all. That's what we do, and we're good at it. But it also didn't need saying. Someone had done the same for us. Donna's generosity was not confined to the proceedings. In the three years we worked together and became friends, she'd mentioned taking on some new task, some new challenge, almost always for her department. These projects always ended up taking more time, always presented more difficulties than she'd imagined. While she occasionally expressed some impatience, we academics are good at that too, I never heard her express regrets. Again, she was no fool. These efforts were worthy of her time. Most of them attracted her because they were intrinsically interesting, because she would learn something new. That's one of the things that made her a very good editor. Yes, you must be generous, but you must also be curious and willing to seriously engage with a colleague's work. Early in my study of the 17th century Republic of Letters, I learned that such generations has always been essential to intellectual life. I watched as a teacher encourage my subject, the scholar Pierre Daniel Ouet, how he in turn fostered the intellectual endeavors of peers and smoothed away for younger scholars. Such generosity by bringing more people to the table has always opened up the possibilities for collaboration. Scholars have a greater tolerance for solitude than a lot of folks do. Our descent, descent in the archives demanded. Yet I suspect that many of us find it a relief when we find someone we can actually work with on significant intellectual work. I experienced that joy with Donna. Our skills complemented each other well. Our temperaments, our works, ethics meshed smoothly. We rarely disagreed. In the end, we respected each other's judgments so much the one would give way if it mattered that much to the other. I should note, too, that Donna did not limit her generosity to our work. She brought her, me into her home, especially the place she loved on the Delaware shore. I met her dogs, her friends, and above all, I met Vicki. I've learned more about Donna's personal history since she passed away. I learned much at her memorial service about a year ago, and I've learned more from Vicki. I believe that part of the reason why Donna and I felt affinity for each other was because at a critical point in our lives, we met people who recognized our intellectual capacities and who intervened to make it possible for us to live the life of the mind. I don't presume to speak for her, but I think it's reasonable to speculate that gratitude was the wellspring of Donna's generosity.
The debts we accumulate to become good teachers, good scholars, good colleagues cannot be repaid. This is very different from the networking that our students who are so relentlessly professionalized are taught and which at its worst reduces people to instruments of our will and extensions of our egos. I teach a survey in early modern European history. When I get to the Reformation, I spend an awful lot of time trying to explain Luther's theology of grace. The kind of debts I'm talking about here are more like grace than entries in a ledger to be tallied and reconciled. These debts are gifts, priceless gifts. They animate us. Through them, we in turn become generous, capable of giving such gifts to others. I cannot overstate the importance of this generosity and the work it accomplishes, not just for a few individuals, but to the intellectual vibrancy of our profession and by extension to the excitement we bring into our classrooms. And I do so with some urgency. I fear that various challenges facing higher education threaten not, to, threaten not just to undervalue this kind of work, but to squeeze it out. We're all under tremendous pressure to show that our efforts have results that can be counted and assigned value. This comes from several directions, including the relentless pursuit of a higher place in the rankings. Please note, I think there's much to be said, for example, for holding us accountable to students who pay a lot of tuition, and I don't think Donna would disagree. But even well-intentioned efforts on that score can lead to a kind of monetization of intellectual activities that fundamentally violates the ethos of the humanities that Donna and everybody in this room believes in. In the end, we will all have no choice but to ask, what's in it for me? In the end, we will all, as Oscar Wilde put it so well, know the price of everything and the value of nothing. The last year Donna and I worked together was the last year of Donna's life. It goes without saying that she could have opted out of editing the proceedings. No one would have questioned the decision to direct what energy remained after her treatments to other tasks or simply to rest. It should be acknowledged, too, that Donna's generation, generosity had a cost that she had not calculated. Indeed, it is incalculable. That is the research project she wanted to undertake, that she looked forward to when she retired in just a few years. These would not happen. I cannot imagine that such thoughts did not cross her mind. She was too smart. She was too honest. She knew what she was up against. Again, I never heard her ex express any regrets. She spent her last year as she had spent so many since she became a historian, generous in service to her students and to us. Thank you. Live in hearts we leave behind is not to die. I met Donna Ryan in 1984 under ghastly circumstances. She was a candidate for a history department position at Gallaudet University, undergoing that torturous examination known as the job interview. At Gallaudet, the only deaf institution of higher learning in the world, and you will notice any of us who have been on the faculty at Gallaudet feel constrained to mention that fact. <laughs> and I'd like to say everything that Barry Bergen said was right, only more so about the climate there. Anyway, at Gallaudet, interviews are a swirl of complexity. Sign language flashing around the table, deaf and hearing faculty conversing in voice and sign, a professional interpreter jumping in and out as needed for the interviewee, all as the candidate usually dropped ill-prepared into this amazing world of sound and silence, tries to grasp what is happening as the discussion ricochets from personal scholarship to attitudes about disabilities to a couple of intra-faculty dust-up diversions <laughs> to the final slightly aggressive question, why would you want to come here? <laughs> Donna held her own, never flinching under the unnerving assault answering a challenge to her teaching credentials by coolly responding, I substituted at the public middle school next door to this campus, and I became quite comfortable being addressed as, hey, honky teacher. I feel confident I can manage a classroom of deaf students. With that, she had my vote. 
joining us at Gallaudet and becoming a treasured friend for nearly 30 years. She proved to be a loyal, interesting, and merry comrade, unique among a collection of wonderful friends. Donna entered into the circle of my family, a special person for me, my husband, and my children. Yet now, I am asked to do the impossible, to capture in these brief moments those Donna qualities that will make her live again for you and explain the depth of my own mourning. At first, as had been suggested, I thought I should talk about Donna's scholarship and the importance of her book, The Holocaust and the Jews of Marseille. Her ability negotiating access to highly sensitive closed records in French archives and her expertise deciphering the documents resulted in a publication that added a critical piece to the narrative of French Jews in World War II. Donna moved on to unprecedented research concerning the death and the Holocaust, spearheading an international conference at Gallaudet that included long forgotten European deaf survivors. But you know about these things, for Donna mingled among you for many years as a well-known member of this illustrious association. Then I wanted to speak about Donna's exceptional generosity. Although she maintained a somewhat cautious and reserved demeanor, it was only a front. She went the proverbial extra mile for students, and there were no limits in her friendships. But I was not sure that you cared to know how she offered her apartment so that my husband and I, then living in Utah, could host a Washington rehearsal dinner for my son, who was to be married at Georgetown. Or that having insisted on this hospitality, Donna then prepared the entire party menu to make the arrangements easier for me. Anyone who has basked in Donna's elegant talent as a hostess understands the lasting memory she created for our family that night. But again, perhaps that anecdote would not resonate well at a scholarly gathering. I thought about the many zany dog adventures that filled Donna's life, but I fretted about whether I should mention that when dealing with animals, Donna was perhaps her most unrestrained and exuberant. She loved her dogs, she loved my dogs, and I am sure she loved your dogs. <laughs> she phoned me in Utah and argued most forcibly that I should allow her to, sh to ship a frisky stray named Tacoma to live with us near the mountains. I resisted. But Donna persisted in finding the right match for Tacoma. She canvassed all her dog-loving friends until Tacoma went to a perfect home and Donna could relax because another lovable animal had been saved. Finally, I settled on what drew me most to Donna Ryan, that which lifted her above the crowd and gave witness to the strength and beauty of her womanhood. It was, of course, her bedrock integrity and unfaltering honesty both of which broadened and deepened the more she traveled the back roads of the world. Donna lived according to a moral compass that did not waver before adversity and oppression. She loathed discrimination in any disguise or on any platform. Across the borders of many countries and in the nooks and crannies of her own, Donna Ryan refused to protect, excuse, or ignore bias. Ultimately, she defined a life mission that applied her principles more directly to herself. Inspired by the philosophy of her beloved partner, Vicki Ferguson, Donna, a forceful activist for the rights of all women, began to carve out her space within the gay and lesbian community at Gallaudet University. This was no light decision on her part. Traditionally, Gay, lesbian, and transgendered faculty drew little attention to themselves on that campus. Although I have great affection for Gallaudet, and I spent important years there, it is a fact that hostility toward gay people was rarely concealed. There were no services or clubs for gays, and in the classrooms, 
slurs or jokes brought no rebukes or illuminating education. For faculty and students, various types of dangers, from job security to personal safety, were real. Donna Ryan walked into this maelstrom, fired with a determination to change the climate around her. She counseled students, reorganized her course offerings, fought for equal benefits for faculty couples, and generally brought institutional attention to long ill-treated members of the Gallaudet community. Not everyone greeted her new public demeanor with enthusiasm, but the liberating sense of empowerment infused the gay community at Gallaudet, generating at least some of the social honesty that Donna so cherished. When the campus was rocked by two brutal murders in the dormitories, it appeared the victims had been targeted because they were gay. Deaf students flocked to Donna, fearful they could not hear an approaching assailant, terrified to stay in their own rooms. Donna became part of a faculty patrol, one of hearing adults who walked the dormitory halls each night until an arrest was made in that case. That was Donna. She saw an unacceptable situation, and she took direct, courageous, and practical action. So that is what I admired most about Donna Ryan. Her integrity was a beacon that shed light on a pathway of courage and accountability. To know Donna, to be her friend, meant she drew you in. You got to walk on that pathway with her. You got the opportunity to become a better person. Donna prodded all of us to become more serious about the meaning of social justice and human decency for everyone. She inspired us to act, to be voices for the poor, the broken, the marginalized. She encouraged us to be vigilant and responsible advocates for the dignity and well-being of all humankind. I expect never to have such a friend again. I called her Ryan woman. She called me butler woman, <laughs> an amusing remembrance of the way a deaf student had addressed one of us. I thought she would always be there, urging me to come to France, attend the Berkshires, vacation at her beach house, or adopt another dog. <laughs> I have not tried to say how cruel it was to lose Donna, but I found these words, and I share them with you. At the temple, there is a poem called Loss, carved in the stone. It has three words, but the poet has scratched them out. You cannot read loss, only feel it. Rest well, Ryan woman. You are greatly loved and deeply missed. Those were beautiful comments and hard to follow. Um, I want to say that how honored I am to be here today. Um, my role, which I chose on this panel, was to speak about Donna as a mentor. And um, she wasn't a mentor in the traditional sense to me. We weren't in the same field at all. Um, I was never her student. Um, we did talk about our work, but that wasn't the primary thing that we talked about. Um, but I still think of Donna as a mentor, and I think of her as a mentor for how to be a better human being. So that's what I'm going to talk about today. Um, and I want to start with a food item that is <laughs> not at all worthy of Donna's wonderful taste in food and wine, a fortune cookie. Um, I received a fortune cookie once in a Chinese restaurant that said, teachers are all around you when you learn what you want to know. 
and I've always remembered that. I thought it was fantastic fortune, and um, and Donna was certainly one of those teachers that uh, I didn't even know I needed. Um, so I want to focus on four points, four lessons that Donna taught me. Um, the first lesson is uh, to enjoy opportunities that come your way. I mean, someone referred to Donna earlier as a bon vivant, and I think that she was a bon vivant in every sense of the word. She, I've never met anyone except perhaps Vicki and perhaps Barry, <laughs> who got so much enjoyment out of life. Um, and I admired that so much, uh, in, especially because I think for me, uh, especially as a young academic, uh, I thought that to succeed in academia, uh, you really couldn't have too much enjoyment. <laughs> you, you had to work, and you had to work hard. And I would traditionally, you know, as starting out, go to conferences and assume I had to be there from beginning to end, attending every panel, listening <coughs> carefully, taking notes. And Donna taught me that it was possible to be a serious academic and yet still enjoy life. Um, I was very resistant at first, <laughs> and I am thankful, extremely thankful, that Donna was so incredibly persistent in her efforts to get me to enjoy life, and, um, and that she taught me that even uh, e experiences which seems, seem like they might be utter disasters can still be enjoyable. And I'm thinking here of uh, the conference, um, and I don't remember if this is the Western or the French Historical Studies, but when we met in Charleston just a few years ago, and Donna and Barry and I spent a very pleasant afternoon wandering in downtown Charleston and looking at all the stalls and things, and then decided that we were all tired, and so we were going to miss some function and that instead of taking the buses that were arranged to, to bring everyone to the reception, we would get there on our own. And so we got on <laughs> the streetcar, and we got off at the Citadel's uh, sports stadium. No one was around. It was very dark and <laughs> very lonely. And we proceeded to circle the stadium, not finding any entrance whatsoever, thinking, oh no, <laughs> we've really messed up this time. And finally, finally, toward, I think there were maybe 15 minutes left of the reception, someone left and opened the door and we raced up. And feeling, at least I felt, incredible relief that we were off the streets of Charleston. They didn't, I'm sure they weren't that dangerous, but it seemed like we were in some godforsaken area. And um, <laughs> nothing against Charleston, just where the stadium was. And, um, and those, that, those were the kind of adventures that I think um, Donna could lead you on. And they were, they were fun, they were interesting, and they, my, and they were just um, examples of how my adventures with Donna are some of my most memorable aspects of conference going. Um, I do remember some papers and some panels and some <laughs> talks, but uh, when I think back, what I think about are, are often these adventures that I've been lucky enough to share with her. A second lesson that Donna taught me was to not be afraid of people that I don't know well. Um, being somewhat shy myself and uh, insecure, I've always been hesitant to um, kind of open up to people that I didn't know. And again, this is something that I'm very grateful for with Donna, was that she was very persistent in making me a friend. And I'm very grateful for that. And I remember, I can't remember when I met Donna, but I remember that um, after I had only known her um, for a short time, and I had seen her at conferences and had dinner, but didn't feel that I knew her well. I guess I have a very high standard of what it means to know someone well. Um, we were going to both be in Paris, and she insisted that I come have dinner with her. And she took me to this restaurant, and you know, I was both uh, very excited to go and very anxious about it. This was a you know senior scholar, and what what could I possibly have to talk about that would be of interest to her? 
and um, going in again with this attitude that, well, we were definitely going to have to talk about work and, you know, uh, how would that go? Um, <laughs> We spent the entire e we had a lovely dinner, of course, a fantastic dinner. We spent the entire evening talking about non-scholarly things and talking about ourselves and our lives <coughs> and our partners and our dogs and uh, everything that um, I think mattered to both of us. And I remember at the end of that dinner, walking back from the restaurant, which I think was near the Luxembourg Gardens to where Donna was staying, in the, um, near the Latin Quarter, and w w I, there's nothing better than walking through Paris at night, and people were out, and it was a lovely evening, and talking, and feeling like I had just met someone who was so wonderful, and so special, and that has, that lesson has served me well in not being as afraid to get to know people who I didn't consider I knew well, and spending time with them, and has, uh, led me to new friends, and I'm very grateful to Donna for that. Donna also taught me, taught me to look for and to appreciate the human in people. Um, as, as scholars, um, as academics, we often look at our colleagues as fellow scholars and fellow academics, which is normal and appropriate. Um, but I think less often as fellow human beings. And I remember, um, again, this Charleston conference where Barry and Donna and I went out to dinner, this wonderful, wonderful dinner at this old something or other. I don't know what the building was. <laughs> it was some old building and had a lot of ambiance. And we had just this incredible dinner with several courses and probably several, several bottles of wine. And it was a lovely evening. And we got into a taxi to head back to the hotel and immediately the mood changed and it was, uh, this was a case when it was not that pleasant to be out at night, I would say. Well, there was something about the partiers out in the, in, the, in the streets and the taxi driver who was either stressed out by them or angry about them. It became a very tense situation very quickly. Um, I was sitting in the front seat and I, we were all kind of silent for a moment um, and I just began asking the taxi driver about his evening and who he had, who he had taken for rides and whatever and, and the mood lightened up and, and when we got out of the taxi, Donna said to me, you must have had a lot of practice in that. And she was right. And it was something I had never talked to her about in terms of my family and my practice in diffusing tense situations. <laughs> but I was so struck that Donna, from that one short episode, knew me and that she recognized that she knew me and that she said that out loud and appreciated that something that I had never thought of as a skill, she actually made me feel like, yeah, I have that skill. That's a good thing. So she's taught me to really look at my colleagues and friends, my students, um, people that I meet in various uh, um, situations as human beings and to, and to recognize them as human beings and to tell them that I, I see them and I appreciate them. Um, Finally, um, and this kind of echoes back to my first point, um, Donna taught me to appreciate absolutely every single moment that you have. I was uh, lucky enough to spend some time uh, last, well, I guess a year and a half ago in San Diego with Vicki and Donna, my partner and I went before the meeting of the French Historical Studies and spent some time with them in San Diego. And We'd had this one, uh, an afternoon we went to the aquarium, we went to a very late lunch. It was a long day, it was kind of stressful driving home in traffic, and Donna wanted to stop and see the sunset. And um, I remember as we, were, as we were navigating the traffic and I was trying to find a place to pull out, she said to me, I don't have that many sunsets left. And we stopped and it was a beautiful, spectacular sunset. I remember Deb, my partner, and I kind of sitting back by the car and letting Donna and Vicki walk up. And the sun was coming down and the colors were kind of reflecting off the waves and there were all these little birds. 
um, on the shore. And I remember thinking that that was such a good thing to think as kind of a motto for every day, you know, that we all don't know how many sunsets we have left, but also that Donna, to the very end of her days, enjoyed every moment of her life. And I think that is just so admirable. I was incredibly fortunate to um, make it to Donna's hospital room just <coughs> hours before she passed away. And I was incredibly fortunate that I was able to thank her for everything that she had taught me. Um, and as I was going up to the room, of course, you know, I felt what was I going to see? What was it going to be like? How difficult was it, was it going to be? I walked into this hospital room that was filled with people. It was wonderful. Vicki was there, of course, but so many of Donna's friends were there. And we spent um, those hours talking and laughing and being there with Donna. And uh, the following day, and I spent with Vicki and a good friend of hers and that friend's daughter. And in talking with them and spending the day with them, I realized how much Donna and Vicki had given to this young girl in terms of asking her about her life, encouraging her to do the things that she wanted to do. I, I, see, I very much saw Vicki um, continuing to do that with the young girl. And, and, and thinking back on that, I thought, you know, Donna is gone. We all miss her. She will never be replaced. But she lives on in all of us. And for that, I think we can be truly grateful. Thank you. She had frequently in her life. She told me that when she was in fifth grade, I believe, um, her fifth grade teacher said, "You're smart. Uh, you should go to a better school." <laughs> <laughs> and encouraged her to go to, to Rose Latin, which truly changed her life. So I'd like to raise a, a toast to the marvelous life of Donna, who inspired us all. That strong moral fiber. Thank you very much for mentioning that, Anne, because that's what I remember about her the most. And whom we're all terribly miss. She was a great bon vivant, had fabulous savoir vivre, great cooking. To Donna. To Donna. To Donna. Yeah. Let's see, I haven't known her as long as um, Kate. But probably as long as Anne. I'm Susan Connor. We have to see oh, for years. <laughs> and um, but we met right after Donna took her job at Gallaudet, and I had just taken my job at Central Michigan. And neither of our universities financed us very well to go to meetings. <laughs> so we actually met in Paris. And at that time, we decided that probably it wouldn't hurt to share a room. So for years and years and years. We pooled our money so we could actually afford it. And then we also discovered that if we pooled our money so we could afford it, we could do an event. And this is like very, very, well, I learned it before you did. And so, you know, I remember the meeting in Las Cruces, which was the gigantic, wonderful food fest when Jacques Pepin was the chef. But Donna had planned uh, time and we went to the festival of Our La Lady of Guadalupe, which was just incredible. And then when we were in Missoula, Montana, we went up to Glacier National Park for lunch. <laughs> and 
the park rangers had to get us down because of snowstorms. <laughs> and it takes like three hours to get back. And she also said, it's okay, Susan, we can miss the talk. <laughs> And then the other time, the meeting was in Boston, and I think, Barry, you were there, when um, she rented a house, and every night we went to pick out our main lobsters, and it was incredible. So she taught me the meaning of events, and it was great. So, Donna. Donna. Um, I'm Amir Piker here. I've only known Donna since 1990. <laughs> Sorry. It's, it's so recent. Um, I've known Donna since 1990, but I, I was very proud to say that in 2008, she let me pick the restaurant. <laughs> <laughs> so I, 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 I knew I had, I had gotten somewhere in life. Um, my, my enduring memory of Donna came when she was... Okay, I think you can hear me in space generally. Um, my enduring memory of Donna is when she was working for the proceedings, she sent me a paper and it was terrible. And so I gave her a call and I, you know, to, to talk about what to do with it. And she picked up the phone and she said, yeah, it's horseshit. But <laughs> the question is, how can we make it better? And Donna's passed. We can't make that better. But we can remember what she stood for to Donna. So Donna. I speak, I think, as a representative of one of those younger colleagues who she helped. Uh, my name's Yael Fletcher. I work at Marseille. And I first got to know Donna through her, her dissertation on Marseille. I got in contact with her. And she was incredibly warm, as everyone said, really very helpful. And I'm very sorry that I can't get to know her better and ask to uh, as for advice <clears throat> to Donna. I think I just have to say one little thing, and this is uh, in reference to something that Susan said, uh, and that is um, uh, I had gone to the uh, Monterey Conference of the Western Society, and uh, I uh, only met Donna once before, but at that conference I saw the professional person, the scholar, talking. And then that evening, uh, because of uh, Susan and a few other people, there was this suggestion that some of us need to go for a boat ride. And so we took a sailboat ride on uh, Monterey Bay to enjoy sunset and champagne. And this is where I got to know the real Donna, a wonderful thing. Anyway, to Donna. I guess I just agree with everybody else, and that is that one of the one of the greatest things about being at a meeting with Donna is you knew there was going to be something, <laughs> <laughs> something, <laughs> some form of playing hooky that was going to be really great, and and you would have a whole you know I mean of course you're here for the papers and the panels too, but it was just going to always be something amazing that uh, so, like so many of you, those are my memories: meals, boat rides, you know, back roads getting lost, moccasin buying in Montana. <laughs> knows what um, and so I'm um, I'm just gonna miss her like crazy and I miss her already and I'll miss, keep missing her and so we'll keep her going you know at all of these meetings she's always gonna be always will be a presence for us at all of these meetings thank you um, Donna wants explained to me that my indifference to champagne was because I had not been exposed to good champagne. <laughs> but she knew good champagne, and I think this is pretty good champagne. <laughs> and I think she would be pleased that we're remembering her with these toasts and with this particular exquisite beverage that she treasured and possessed a vast encyclopedic knowledge about. So I would like to think of her as always the champagne lady of our profession. <laughs> and <clears throat> while I'm talking, I want to say that we all owe a great debt to Kate Norberg, who 
has organized this event, who has uh, really uh, brought it all together, arranged, made all the arrangements. Uh, she's responsible for our drinking champagne, I think, and uh, so uh, <coughs> please thank, remember to thank Kate uh, for this, uh, this very good memorial for Donna Ryan. Would someone else like to speak? I know, I'll use this one. I feel like I'm on television. <laughs> uh, oh, I am. Um, <laughs> I, I just want to briefly tell this. I love to tell the story of how Donna and I first got to know one another. Uh, after, I was, uh, after I had been hired, I'd already I'd met her briefly. But I didn't really know her at all. I had had my own horrible interview process at, <laughs> at, at Gallaudet. I had been hired, but I hadn't started working there yet. And we were both at the uh, French Historical Studies meeting in El Paso. And so uh, I took the opportunity at some point to say, well, you know, let, let's have coffee. We had coffee. And, uh, you know, it's, it's uh, 22 years ago. Things were not as they are now. so. Just somewhat uh, delicately, I came out to her uh, as gay, and then she came out to me. And I said, well, you know, this is a perfect opportunity for us to go out and, uh, and get to know one another better. So uh, at the banquet on Saturday, after the meal ended, but just before the speaker started, the two of us tiptoed <laughs> out to th th the back of the room. Now, neither Donna nor I could actually really pass unnoticed, <laughs> leaving the back of the room. <laughs> and uh, we left and took a cab to the local gay bar where we proceeded to spend the evening drinking beers and slamming back shots of tequila. And that was the beginning of a wonderful 20-year <laughs> friendship, um, emblematic of so many aspects of our friendship. Uh, we also had names for one another. She called me, I called her Dr. D and she called me Dr. B. <laughs> and uh, also, obviously, just out of affection. And so, uh, to Dr. D. Well, I want to thank everyone for coming today, for sharing their memories, for sharing their thoughts. Uh, my dear friend Donna Ryan. Um, now, I, you should know that her work, Vicki assures me that her work, that her, her papers, her ongoing research, uh, which Ann mentioned, will be archived and available. She would want that very much for younger scholars. Um, it will certainly be hard for me to come to the Western in the future without thinking of her. I think that's the same sentiment of many people in this room. Thank you very much. Madame, we'll miss you. <laughs> oh, Vicki would like to say something. First housekeeping. We have a reservation this evening at La Petite Auberge for anyone who would like to continue dining and drinking in Donna's memory and sharing stories and just hanging out um, at 7.30. And we have maps and directions here. And we'll have at least one car, if not two, here um, around 7 at the reception area for people who'd like to join us there. Um, I don't know if I, I can do this. Um, um, one of the difficult things of coming here this, this week has been to realize how many of you are so important in my life as well, and how hard it would be to have, have to lose all of you as well. So, um, I will not probably be able to come to a lot of these meetings, but I have a gorgeous house on the beach. <laughs> and it can accommodate 
six to eight people very, very comfortably without even having to use an airbed. <laughs> <laughs> And so I just want to extend an invitation when you're on the East Coast or you're traveling through and can make your flight, you know, delay a couple of days, please come see me, come hang out at the beach or the Tacoma Park House. And when I'm traveling, um, if I'm headed your way, I'll let you know and we'll try to m make sure that we can maintain those connections. I cannot th thank you enough. <laughs> for the love and friendship and support that you've given her and me <laughs> and the support um, th that came in the last year of her life and since she's passed in cards and letters and emails and packages it really means a lot I just want you to know that Thank you, Vicki. And don't worry, Donna, your traditions of hospitality, good wine, good food, continue. <laughs> yes. Thank you all for being here. <laughs> She's a great cook. She's a great cook. Thank you.